Beloved, this is the fifth Sunday in Lent, and it features two of my favorite stories in Scripture. The first is from Ezekiel, the Valley of the Dry Bones, and the second is from John, the emotional account of Jesus raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. Throughout the season of Lent, we've been watching for further revelations about who this Jesus is and why his life mattered and how he is the Christ, the Messiah, the promise of eternal life. And on the fifth Sunday of Lent, we are rapidly moving toward Holy Week. We're moving closer and closer to Jesus' trial and crucifixion, but we're also moving closer to resurrection. So here today, we have two stories of new life one that you've heard. These are stories that prepare us to understand that the death of a body is not all that there is. They are stories that remind us that what makes us human is actually the limitations of our body. I encourage you this week to sit with the story of Lazarus, which is found in John's Gospel in chapter 11. It's an important story. Ask yourself what Jesus is doing here. Think about how some might be threatened by the miracle of Jesus bringing the dead to life. Think about how, think about the things that we grieve. It's a stunning story that can give rise to good soul work as we prepare for Easter at home. But this week, the Holy Spirit has walked with me and steeped me in the story that is the more ancient story about a prophet and some bones and some flesh and breath. Ezekiel was called as a prophet prophet while in exile in Babylon. He was among the first wave of Jewish leaders driven out of Jerusalem by the Babylonian armies. In short order, a second wave was pushed out and the city of Jerusalem was flattened. With the temple destroyed, all the normalcy known to the Jews would have disappeared. As God's chosen people who had been led from slavery into the promised land, suddenly all that they possessed had been whisked away. Even the house where God dwelled in their tradition was gone. It had to have been a disorienting time, a time when nothing was as it had been, a time when all normal patterns were gone, a time when work lives had been upended, when financial lives had been upended, when spiritual lives had been upended. I want to remind us that in Jewish culture, they do not separate religion, their belief systems from all of the other things, the economy, societal norms, food culture. To be Jewish was all encompassing. When life was radically interrupted, eyes turned to God and folks despaired as if God had left the building. So into the season of exile, God calls a prophet. Prophets were called upon to speak truth into the times and to see things in a different way. Ezekiel is called in a season when the Jews really need to remember that they are God's people no matter where they find themselves. God shows Ezekiel a stark scene, a valley of dry bones. The Lord tells the prophet to speak life into the bones. Suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked And there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But with sinew and flesh still, there was no breath. And God commands Ezekiel to prophesy to the breath. Prophecy to the breath, prophecy mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. He called on the breath. Call on the breath, O mortal. The Hebrew word is found throughout Hebrew scriptures. We've talked about it before. It is the word ruach. Call on the ruach, the very breath, the very ruach that was breathed into humankind at creation. Call on the breath, because a body is just a body without the breath of God. A body is just a body without a spirit. Breathe spirit into these bodies. 
Well, of course I sat with this text this week. We are surrounded by news of a virus that literally steals breath. News that takes our breath away as we hear it and learn more about it. Breath taken away. In the wide scope of Hebrew scripture, this can be read as a story of national identity, a story about the people who are Israel. It is a cheerleader story for the Jews. God is with you even when you are not where you expected to be. But sometimes stories of national identity can be dangerous. They can be misused. They can be read as imparting favor. They can distract us from the bigger story. Let's remember some of the bigger story. Early in Lent, we remembered how Abram and Sarai received the promise that in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In recent weeks, Jesus met a Samaritan woman of all things at the well and offered her abundant life. Springing forward and looking toward Pentecost, we know that the Holy Spirit rushed in on the wind and people of all languages suddenly understood one another. The breath that enlivens us goes beyond any national identity. The breath that enlivens us encompasses all of creation. That's powerful right now. Have you looked at the COVID-19 map that Johns Hopkins maintains online? It tracks confirmed cases all over the globe. If you haven't taken a look, I encourage you to go find it. You can look at how the red dots grow and spread out as cases are identified. And if you look closely, you can actually see based on where the hot spots occur, how people move from place to place spreading that tiny virus. I confess that looking at that map depresses me at times. It's easy to be really overwhelmed by how a tiny virus spreads. But also I see that we are not all that distant, not all that separated, not all that unique. You see, we are all human. We are one in our humanness. And in our shared human condition, we are both vulnerable and powerful. How might we look at that virus map and imagine how goodness might be spread in as well? In this strange season of social distancing and global pandemic, I cling to the idea that the God who loves me and the God who loves you also loves all of God's creation in all parts of the world. It changes things when we will remember this. God weeps for those who have no clean water in this crisis. God weeps for those who do not have access to good health care. God weeps for those who cannot find toilet paper or milk because somebody else has a closet full. God weeps when we insist on our, that our agenda is more important than our neighbor's health and safety. My encouragement to all of us in these strange times is to see our work in line with Ezekiel's to prophecy not just to the bones, but to also call on the breath, the very ruach, the breath of God that enlivens all of us in the same way, in the very same way, to see the common thread that connects us and to honor it and to praise it and to respect it, to do all in our power to offer life to one another, in fact, to speak life into that which seems dead. Right now, That means staying home. It means using the phone and the internet and the mail to share love and encouragement. It means sharing from our privilege when we're able to. Maybe it means sending a check to a local nonprofit that houses the homeless or feeds the hungry. Maybe it means creating beauty in whatever way we're able. A poem, a picture, a flower arrangement, a tasty meal. Maybe it means quieting ourselves and making space for others to breathe, to receive breath. And in doing these things, we share life. May it be so. Amen. Breathe on me, breath of God. 
fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine.